Hello everyone and welcome to Market Outlook 2018. My name is Adam Koch. I am President and Portfolio Manager at Libertas Wealth Management Group in Columbus, Ohio. Happy New Year. Um, I hope you enjoyed your holidays, had a long relaxing break, and that you've recharged your batteries and that you're ready to hit the ground running in 2018 here. So um, without further ado, let's just jump right ahead into this outlook for this coming year. But before we do that, let's uh, get a couple housekeeping items done as usual. First of all, we want to optimize your screen. So if you look at YouTube here on the bottom right hand corner, there's a little gear. You want to click on that, which is going to give you a drop down menu, which you'll click on next to quality. And then you want to select the highest quality that there is. The higher the, the uh, 7020 HP is on this screen, but you might have 1080p or so on and so forth. Something along those lines is where you want to click it. That way you can see the charts easier, uh, blow up the screen to your uh, to your full monitor's potential and so on. So. Um, if you have any questions or trouble, just give our call office a call, and uh, someone at our office can give you some help with that. Moving on, so let's talk about stocks. Last time we talked about bonds first. This year, let's talk about the stock market. Um, a piece of data that I got from uh, a few different places, um, StockTwits.com. I saw it on a guy named Bama Broker. He goes by Bama Broker. There's a uh, um, Andrew Thrasher, portfolio manager in uh, Indianapolis, um, also posted this, and I found it really interesting. A guy by the name of Dana Lyons at the Lyons Share found that um, when you add up the cumulative total drawdown, so all the losses that took place throughout the entire year, so none of the gains but just the losses, and you add those losses up, the Dow had a cumulative loss of 27.36% on all of its down days throughout the year 2017. Um, and as you can see here on this chart, that is the lowest that we've seen since, well, since 1915 on this chart, but it goes back even further than that. Um, the prior record was 31.45%, which was set in 1965, um, but it's the only other year that saw less than a 38% uh, number in total losses. So I think that this chart just kind of goes to show how, I don't want to say how easy this year was because I think it's counterintuitive, but um, there was very, very little volatility. Um, there were not a lot of down days. Um, it was just kind of a smooth and easy ride this year, and um, there really wasn't a whole lot to be too excited or fearful about, to be honest. So um, aside from the fundamentals, of course, the stuff you see in the news, which you know usually unrightfully freaks people out. So moving on to the next chart here. Um, this is I apologize this is so antiquated, but uh, I had to use my trading software instead of my research software this time around because I wanted to see intraday data. But um, a couple things I want to point out. This is the S&P 500. You can see obviously in an uptrend here. There's no doubt about that. Um, but most recently here, as you look at the, uh, the trend in the S&P 500 up top here since November, again, we've got clearly a positive trend, but we have higher lows and higher highs. On the other side down here, this is a momentum indicator called Relative Strength Index, or RSI, this is RSI 14, or a 14 period, in other words, 14 day RSI in, uh, indicator. And what we're seeing here is lower highs on RSI 14 relative to higher lows on the S&P 500. And what that means typically is that we're starting to see a negative divergence or weakness in the price above. So I don't have a picture to show you from uh, prior charts that I've shared in the past, but bottom line here is that this is a reason to, at least in the near term, be a little bit concerned for a pullback, which would be completely healthy. Um, even a correction would be completely healthy in this market. Um, it's a kind of a normal part of the cycle of bull markets. If I switch gears, same exact uh, situation, but this time we're looking at the Dow instead of the S&P 500. So again, going back to November, we can see higher lows in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but then if we look at RSI, uh, RSI 14, um, the Relative Strength Index is telling us that um, we could see some weakening in the short term coming here uh, from Relative Strength in the index. So just something to keep in mind. As we look back at the prior year, again, I know this is kind of a messy chart, but I just want to point out a few things. First of all, this gray line is the 252-day exponential moving average, which just simply means that it's the one-year trend. The blue line right here is the six-month trend. This line right here is the three-month trend, and then the dark uh, black line here, which really kind of ties pretty close to the um, candlestick chart itself, that's the uh, one-month trend. But at any rate, what we want to see here in any good market, healthy market, we want to see the uh, gray line, the one-year trend sloping up. We want to see the six-month trend sloping up and trading above the one-year. And we want to see the three-month trend sloping up and then trading above the six-month and the one-year trend. So 
All those things are happening here. And again, there's really no doubt. It doesn't matter what you see in the news. It doesn't really matter who the president is or what he or she is doing or tweeting for that matter. What matters is the market is telling us that the trend is uh, up and that the path of least resistance is still north. Now, down here in this second window, this is a price momentum oscillator, which was uh, an indicator invented by Carl Swenlin. Um, and what it it's basically kind of like RSI, but it measures momentum. And you can see when this dark black line crosses below the thinner line, um, this is kind of a sell signal. And what I've done is I've put red lines above in the chart, vertical lines to represent whenever this turns negative and blue lines whenever it turns positive. And you can go up, go back here and you can see blue line, it goes up, red line kind of goes sideways to down, blue line kind of goes up, red line down, blue line up, and so on and so forth. So you can pause uh, the video here and look at this yourself and kind of analyze it. But the two things here we want to pay attention to is A, we did see a most recent uh, negative crossover. So um, we could see, again, more evidence for a pullback here. And then we're, um, I don't want to say horribly overbought, but maybe a little bit overheated um, with the market going up for so long, for uh, so fast, and uh, without any pullbacks or corrections. So again, just Things long-term, intermediate-term look really, really healthy. I just wouldn't be surprised at all, nor would I think it would be a horrible thing if we saw a pullback in the market. Moving on to bonds and interest rates. Okay, so what we're looking at first here is short-term interest rates. This is the 10-year Treasury yield, not the bonds, but the actual interest rates. And you can see, again, we've seen this before. Uh, I've had this in prior videos, articles. Um, but the, the picture, the summary here is that we've got interest rates pretty much going down since the early 80s. Um, I'm sure all of us have heard this before, uh, but when interest rates go down, bond values go up. When interest rates go up, bond values go down. So the big question, of course, here has been, what's going to happen in the short term? And we really don't know, of course, right? Um, we're not trend predictors, we're trend followers. But I think what we see here is um, a potential for interest rates to kind of tap this trend line again or get close to it and maybe even revert down again before it, it totally turns around for the long term going forward. So we'll have to see what happens there. But um, a really close eye has to be watched on interest rates and bonds. And this is why investing money in the bond market this past couple years, and this is a two-year chart, has been extremely difficult there's not a whole lot of bonds that are really making any money. Um, it's really hard to find the ones that are trending. Um, you can see here this this line right here in the middle is the one-year trend of the iShares uh, Barclays aggregate ETF for bonds, so the AGG. And we're kind of sitting in no man's land here where the, the trend, the one-year trend is going sideways. So, I mean, that's it's a really, again, a really tough time to kind of determine what stuff's going up and what stuff's going down. Now, we can drill down into the bond market and we can cherry pick uh, bond positions, bond investments that are stronger than others. And that's what we do at our office is we're looking for the strongest uh, subsectors or subcategories within the bond market and trying to hold on to those positions rotating out of those positions when they weaken um, and into new ones. But bottom line here is that when you look at the bond market as a whole we can see in 2016 this big jump you know from about in the, in the on the AGG from about 107 to 113 after which it spent the next six months going back down to 107 and then since then it's just kind of creeped around sideways for the most part so um, long term going forward I guess if there's one thing I could say for this coming year um, and the years going forward really it's gonna be to be really really careful with your bond positions um, and the bond investments that you own because not if but when interest rates do go up um, it's going to be extremely difficult with headwinds like that against us where we got bonds going down asset, net asset value so the value of bonds going down in our faces um, the interest rates are going to have to be enough to recapture the loss of principal which is going to be pretty difficult to do um, before I move on, I want to apologize. I, I got a cold for Christmas um, that showed up a few days late, so I apologize. I'm losing my voice here, but um, let's keep going. So a couple, just one other chart that I noticed that I, I think has been getting a lot of buzz lately, and that's oil or energy, and this is specifically the United States oil ETF or USO. Um, this is a, an 18-month chart, and what you can see right off the bat are these two parallel red lines, which represent a trading range. Um, going all the way back to summer of 2016. You can see back here we've got a false breakout, call it a head fake, then it falls, bounces off the bottom of the range, hits the top of the range, then we get a false breakdown in uh, summer of this year, or I should say last year now at this point, 
And then since then, we've actually seen some momentum. And um, at this point, it's tapping the top of that range again. So um, if we go down here to the middle pane, we've got price momentum oscillator, so PMO, <clears throat> with several positive uh, crossovers. And then most importantly on this particular chart, in the bottom pane, we have RSI 14, or a 14-day relative strength index in this case. And you can see how prior to uh, the summer, when we had a little blip down here, um, and a breakout into bear, I'm sorry, bullish territory above 70 on uh, RSI. We really didn't have any other reason to own oil. And you can see here we've got bearish down here at the bottom, a bearish breakout, bearish breakdown, bearish breakdown over and over again. It wasn't until November that we finally saw oil break back above 70 on RSI 14. Um, but what I really would like to see, you can see how it's kind of starting to break out here again. I really like to see oil pull back. To maybe around 11 20 or 11 dollars um, on this particular etf um, and then even break out above 12 20 and hold there for a few days before adding a position and we don't want to have another head fake um, as we had back in summer of 2016. okay so let's close things out for the day here and just show you some final uh, big picture charts looking out into the future some pictures that uh, i think say a lot about uh, where the economy and where the stock market uh, could go from here. Uh, the first one's kind of bigger picture. Um, I don't really talk a whole lot about economics, um, balance sheets, and so on, but I felt uh, this chart was really interesting. Um, I, I found it on um, Andrew Thrasher's blog, um, and he got it from Callum Tonis and Cam Hui and, on Twitter. And um, what we're looking at is the stock market here, this jagged line, and then overlaid is the Fed balance sheet. So bottom line i guess when you look at this chart what what you're looking at is how the federal reserve added free money to the system as we all know quantitative easing qe1 qe2 uh, qe eternity as it was once called here um, and then it stopped in 2015 and it has not added any more money to the system since then obviously we had that two-year period in 2015 and 16 where the market went sideways um, and throughout that period went down 14% uh, and 12% twice within that two-year period. And then we had the election, and the market's been kind of off to the races since then. Um, but the plan for the Fed going forward is to actually start reducing its balance sheet, and uh, it's going to be interesting. We're going to have to find out what happens and how much the market likes it when they start raking that cash back in. So um, kind of something to watch for. In the short term, uh, this is uh, Stock Traders Almanac. This is always good stuff. This is the average return of the market over the um, in uh, January. So this is a midterm election year, January market performance. So um, that's the year we're in. Last year was a post-election year. So you can see the average performance of the market, and I'm just going to use uh, the Dow here. It's usually up the first day or two. Then we typically see weakness. Um, going down all the way until about the 17th trading day of the month, or we'll call it the last week of the month, after which it starts to pick up again. Um, so generally what you see in, in midterm election years is weakness uh, for the bulk of the month, and then uh, things kind of turning around toward the end of the month. However, when we look at the whole year, and this is uh, specifically with regard to midterm, again, midterm election years, um, after a year when a post-election year has been positive. So um, black, the black line here is a midterm election year, the average performance since 1949 of the S&P 500 when we're in a midterm election year after a post-election year last year was positive. And you can see generally, again, we see that negative performance in January, followed by a really good few months leading up until almost May, and then weakness from pretty much, call it late April, early May, all the way down, my apologies, all the way down until about October, after which the market tends to take off um, just before the midterm elections. <clears throat> now, the other line down here, this is the average uh, return of the market in all midterm election years uh, with no regard to whether or not the prior year, the post-election year, was positive. So what, a couple things just kind of want to point out here. Uh, it's been almost two years since the last 10% correction. Looking at history, it's most likely to have some sort of correction here um, at some point. I mean, I guess it's not totally uh, impossible to see the market continue up without a correction this entire year. But if it were to happen, my guess is it would probably happen sometimes during this seasonally weak months between Mar um, sorry, between May and October. Um, as a reminder, going if you watched our videos or, or read any of our commentary in the past, um, you'll also know that the market went up from 2011 to 2015 
for 1,326 days without a single correction, um, which is extremely out of the ordinary. So um, <clears throat> this past year, and really since the election, we haven't had even the normal 3 5% pullbacks on average that you would normally see in, in an average year. So it's been a really, really, like I said, when we started the conversation, it's been a really, really easy year. And um, going into next year, it wouldn't surprise me to see a little bit more uh, volatility, which again, would be completely normal. Um, <clears throat> and we wanna be investing in the market as long as the trend is up. Speaking of the trends and, and history and records, um, this right here is Black Monday on the left side of the chart here. So this is the uh, S&P 500. This right here from Black Monday until the dot-com bubble is the longest bull market in history since the 1800s. Then we have the crash, the dot-com bubble crash. Then the market goes up <clears throat> 120%, give or take a couple percent. It peaks, mortgage crisis takes place, market goes down 57%, bottoms out in um, 2009. And now we're living in the second longest bull market in history since the 1800s. And in, in the meantime, there's this arguable point here, again, this two-year period where the market was flat with a downward bias um, in 2015 and 16, where <clears throat> there's been plenty of arguments out there that maybe that was the last crash, even though technically it wasn't necessarily a United States stock market uh, defined by the uh, S&P 500, the Dow, or um, anything along those lines as a 20% drawdown or larger. So, I mean, we're going to have to see what happens here. But um, at the end of the day, anytime we're sitting in the second longest up market in history, I think it pays to be conservative and not to go all in and leave your money sitting on the table with 100% risk all the time. Um, and that's exactly the opposite of what we do. So we're more in, uh, we're more interested in following the trend. And as long as the trend is up, then we want to be participating. If the trend starts to break down, then we want to back off because at the end of the day, we cannot beat every 5% or even 10% pullback. And so here's a, here's a good example. If we lose 10% in any given year, it only takes an 11% gain mathematically to get back to where we started. If we lose 15%, which is, again, a normal correction, it only takes 18% to get back to where we started. What we want to avoid are the big drops. You know, so we want to avoid the 30% losses, the 40% losses, and of course, the 50% losses, which mathematically, if you have a million dollars, you lose 50%, you're down to a half million. If that half million go grows to the tune of 50%, you've only got 750,000. So we've probably, most of us have probably seen this math before, but the bottom line again is we want to avoid the big ones. That's what we're trying to do here. So in closing, just to kind of get our eye off the technical ball, um, just wanted to point out that um, this is a study done. Uh, Go Banking Rates did this study. Again, I think I stole this from uh, Andrew Thrasher again. Thank you, Andrew, for all the great data and making my <laughs> making my life easier uh, this year. But um, he's given us three great charts. But um, there's a study done. What, what were Americans' biggest money regrets in 2017? And I found this interesting. So again, we can't... We can't um, decide who the president is you know no no individual can that way anyway we cannot decide um we cannot change what the market does we can't change what the economy does recessions but the one thing we can change is how much we're saving and you can see 36 percent the largest by by a long shot the long, uh, largest portion of people uh who had biggest the biggest regrets were in the category of not saving enough money um, or the n number two was spending money on non-essentials, which I'd have to say that those two probably go together pretty closely. And then you can see what the rest were here. So not investing in the stock market, uh, falling into debt, paying for college, and so on. Um, one last little statistic to share. Today was the end of the Santa Claus rally, which is the last five trading days of the year and the first couple trading days of the new year. And what we want to see is we want to see the Santa Claus rally positive. The average return of the Santa Claus rally over the last, I think, well, 66 years, 67 years is about 1.4%. So bottom line, we went it positive. Um, this year came out to being up about 1.1%. Um, the next metric we want to look at is how the first five days of the year do, which we'll know by the end of this week. We want that to be positive. And then last but not least is the January barometer. That's the performance of January as a whole. Whenever all three of these uh, are positive, Stock Traders Almanac, they call that the, uh, the January trifecta. And um, I think that what we typically see is really, really good years in the market, just like we saw last year where all three were positive. 
So I'm going to go ahead and end today. Um, I tried to go through that fast while at the same time um, providing enough detail to make it semi-easy to understand. But please, by all means, um, if you have any questions at all, um, please reach out to me. Um, I'm always available. Even if I can't respond right away, I'm happy to respond to any questions. Um, if you'd like to receive an intro kit sent to you via email or snail mail, um, if you'd like to talk to our office about setting up an introductory meeting to get a second opinion with myself or one of our financial advisors on your retirement plan, uh, please call or email us anytime. And remember, um, you don't have to be a client to ask a question, and it's always the case. So hope you had a happy new year, and we will look forward to talking to you soon.